to show a little bit more independence and ability to know what they are doing when it comes to food and cooking. So there are just a few things that I wanted to go over really quickly. In case you didn't notice, we have the eggs that were over here in the back. If you need to use the restroom at any point, oh yes, there are two eggs over here in the back on the left and the right. If you ever need to use the restroom, it's just through these doors. The women's restroom is the first one, and then on the other side of the water fountain is the men's restroom. And of course, if you have any questions for any of the recipes, feel free to go ahead and ask the presenter when they're done with their demo, or you can save them towards the end. Either one is fine, because we will have a section at the end if you have any questions. And what Anna David is doing right now is passing out a hard copy of all of the recipes that we'll be doing today. So if you wanted to know how to replicate them or if you wanted to pass the information along, we'll have that info readily available to you. All right, so the first thing that I wanted to do is actually invite our pastor, Pastor John Kurowski, up here for an opening prayer. Pastor? You're a Christian church, and you believe that Christ came to redeem the spirit, soul, and the body. Uh, we are also taking care of our bodies, and uh, we also want to give Him glory and thanks. Uh, let us pray. Your Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for another day that we are breathing, that we are alive, that we are created in your image. And I'm also thankful, also, Lord, for this opportunity here that we can learn some things about the healthy food uh, and that we can also take care of our bodies because we can take care of our bodies. I pray that it will be a good time and that the learning that you will give us strength that all the things that you learn that we can be able to implement in our lives. Thank you. In the name of Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. All right, before we get into the cooking demos, I did want to go over a quick, neat little acronym with you all. It's kind of part of the philosophy that really encapsulates some of the health principles that we're trying to promote here. And the abbreviation is called New Start. And we do have some slides so that our friends here in person and our friends who are online and seeing us through their screens can receive the information too. So let's talk a little bit about New Start. And if you do want to find more information about it, you can go to newstart.com. There's a lot more information than I'll be able to give you, but I'll just run down a quick process through each letter with you. So the very first letter that we have in New Start is nutrition. And you've probably heard this wherever you go, you know, you need to have a, a very balanced whole food diet. And the reason for that is because we see that that's one of the healthiest diets that you can model and incorporate in your life. When you have fruits, when you have vegetables, legumes, or nuts and seeds, it gives you the chance to not only get one good food group in, but as many as possible. And another thing about nutrition to understand is it's not just what you eat, but it's also when you eat. One of the healthier eating patterns to establish is eating at mealtime and trying to avoid snacking in between. It gives you a little bit more you know, emotional independence from just mindlessly eating and being intentional about it, but it also gives your digestive system, your stomach a break. Uh, everything needs rest at some point, and our stomach is included in that. So try to give it a rest every now and then Space your meals out to about five to six hours apart. And then there is a note at the bottom saying that raw salads can help aid with digestion at about every meal. I know some people they like to eat salads right away in the morning. Some people it's kind of more so towards the, the lunch or dinner portion, but trying to incorporate more of those, especially the, the leafy greens, is really good. It has a lot of minerals and vitamins as well as antioxidants to help nourish your body. The next letter that we have when you start is exercise. And exercise, depending on how much you love it, you may or may not enjoy that word, but exercise can really be good for you physically and emotionally. We see that exercise, um, and the recommended guidelines being about 75 or 150 minutes of moderate activity, or 75 minutes of vigorous activity every week, or some sort of combination of the two, can really aid in several areas physically. You can improve your cardiovascular strength, your muscular strength, you can improve your rest of heart rate, which means that your heart is working more efficiently, circulating the oxygen in the blood throughout your body. And then we also see that as a result of making sure that you're physically uh, capable of maintaining your body, you will be able to see some changes, maybe in obesity, maybe in blood 
blood pressure, cholesterol levels, but also in some more unseen uh, symptoms, such as maybe anxiety or a lot of depression, a lot of low self-esteem, or any other uh, depressive symptoms or stress in general. And it can also improve your sense of self worth When you're done with something, whether you just ran a mile for the first time in your life or you bench press a way you never thought you could, you'll feel a sense of accomplishment. And that can go a really long way in helping you be a better you the next day. The next letter that we have in New Start is W, which means water. Now, water is our friend. It's, it's good to incorporate water in the body because that's the liquid fuel that your body uses to hydrate its system and also to flush out toxins that your body wants to get rid of. The, technically, the science behind how much water you need is very individual. You know, what I may need is not necessarily what someone who's taller or shorter than me may need, but typically the recommendation is six to eight glasses of water, a glass being about eight ounces or eight fluid ounces of water. So trying to get in enough um, to make sure that you are properly hydrated is a good way to make sure that you are also properly fueled yourself. And there are also some tips in terms of, well, how do I flush out my system on a good basis? One of them could be just drinking two to three glasses of water in the morning, especially if it's warm so that your body doesn't have to work too hard to make the cold water to the room temperature of the body tend to where it needs to process it. But that can also help to make sure that all the, the toxins that your body wants to get rid of that's processed in overnight can indeed actually leave the system. And we do have a video on our YouTube channel, Elm Curse SBA, and it's called Hydrotherapy. It was led by Dr. Eddie Ramirez, who focuses a lot on health research and practical uh, pieces of information. So if you want to find that, you'll have to search on our YouTube channel for COVID-19, the new normal. It was done May 30th of last year. The next letter in New Start is Sun. Now, sun is very important. We probably understand this after, you know, 60% of the year is not really being all that sunny. We have the sun coming out now. Um, but sunlight, when taken in moderation, you know, depending on how sensitive you are to exposure to direct sunlight, it's yeah, really yeah, good yeah, for yeah. getting your vitamin D in. Also, in terms of making you feel a little bit more happy, you may have noticed, especially if you are very sensitive like myself to a lack of sun, you'll notice bit more on the downside when you don't have enough sun. And so the the general healing properties that it has in addition to vitamin D and getting enough is that it can also help you with calcium absorption, making sure that your bones are strong. It can also help to avoid certain bacteria and viruses, not all of them, but a good portion of them, as well as help with quality mental health. And like I mentioned earlier, it's in terms of how much sun you need, the recommendation is about a half hour every day if you can. It might be a little bit more difficult for those of, who, uh, for those of us who live in a cloudier area. But nonetheless, if you can get about that much every day, fantastic. Don't forget to put on your sunblock, especially if you notice that you burn a little too easily. But make sure you limit your exposure based off of your individual sensitivity. Now, the next letter in our new start, and I have to remember, what is the, the first T? Uh, you know, you'd think I would remember all of the letters because I'm the one who made the slide. Um, but the next T, if you can go to the next slide for me, please, is temperance. And so what we mean by temperance is making sure that everything comes in moderation. You know, you want to obtain as much of the good that you can and then avoid the bad that you can. So, you know, every now and then a muffin isn't going to be too harmful, but only in moderation. If that's all that you're eating, then that's not a balanced and whole food diet, right? And we do have this quote from How to Live. We don't have that, that specific book in, in the physical copies back there that you can grab on your way out, but you can look it up on Google. I'm not sure which site would be most helpful, but this quote says, in order to preserve health, temperance in all things is necessary. Temperance in labor, temperance in eating and drinking. So making sure that you eat when your body needs the fuel, and that you get enough water, but also that you give your body rest. You don't want to overwork yourselves. You've probably felt how down and how, uh, let's see, how ragged you feel when you don't have enough rest. So temperance just not for your diet, but also for you and your energy and your time. And then our next letter in New Start is air. And we may have felt this, especially with being indoors for so long, for almost a year. For some of us, it's been uh, a lot of consecutive days indoors. But it's really good to try and expose yourself to clean air when you can. Uh, you know, if you live downtown in a very 
air congested area. It may or may not be a little bit difficult for you, but if you can, when feasible, try to spend as much time outdoors as you can. Try to ventilate your windows or the indoor spaces as much as you can as well, because the stale air needs to be able to circulate. You don't wanna just stay in the same kind of air for very long, right? Because then all of the, the uh, everything that you are breathing out needs to be able to get out of your space as well. So try to ventilate your windows when you can. I don't recommend it when it's a blizzard or when it's 30 degrees, but hey, if it works for you, then it works for you. And then our next letter in New Start is rest, R for rest. And like I briefly mentioned earlier, it's really good for your body to rest. Everything was made to rest, uh, whether it is something that we created like a car or whether it's us as people. We can't just keep going, going, going. We have to be able to take a day off um, sometimes, especially during really difficult weeks, we may need two or three days off, or we may just want to take the whole week off from work if that's what we want, uh, if that's what we can do, of course. But it's always good to take rest. It's always good to make sure that you have a good amount of quality sleep. So, you know, not a lot of tossing and turning sleep where you're, you're not really getting into your REM cycle, um, but making sure that you have about seven to nine quality hours of sleep. And going to bed about nine o'clock, um, I'm very bad at that, to be quite honest. But going to bed on the earlier side around nine o'clock can help you wake up more easily, kind of, you know, going down with the sun and then coming up with the sun. It can be a bit more natural for your body. And, you know, there are some times, especially when we're a bit more physically capable, we can just keep on going on five or six hours of sleep. But that's not very good for us in the long run. We may be able to sustain it for a little bit, but what's really optimal for your body to make sure that it's always kept in the best possible shape is to make sure that you do indeed get about seven to nine hours of sleep. And then proper rest habits, just to let you know, they do contribute to physical and seen benefits. You know, improved quality of life, improved mental state of well-being. It allows the body to replenish its systems. And especially if anyone does like to work out or they like to weight lift or anything along those lines, rest is that when you're asleep, that's when your muscles are able to recover. So it's very, very important, practically speaking as well, to make sure your body rests and that you give that time to yourself too. And then the last letter that we have in New Start is trust, and specifically trusting in God. Like our pastor mentioned earlier, we are a Christian lifestyle center, and so this is one thing that we particularly like to safeguard. And, you know, whether or not you realize it, there is a really big and substantial benefit to trusting in a higher power. Uh, what we've seen, especially during COVID, is that people who feel more isolated tend to also see negative impacts in the rest of their aspects of their lives, whether it's they don't feel as motivated to exercise or they don't feel as motivated to work. And so when you're trusting in a higher power, you have a sense of purpose. You, you have a sense of direction. And even when things go wrong, you don't feel like they will be horrible and they'll be so exhausting forever. There will be an end. And it does give you a sense of rejuvenated work. And so what we encourage people to do is really trust not just in your own capabilities, because, you know, sometimes we need a break, right? Um, but also to trust in the capabilities of, of God who never tires and who never has any sort of hindrance that he cannot overcome. And we have seen that there are studies that are related to positive physical and emotional states of well-being when there is a higher sense of religion or spirituality in an individual, such as, you know, they're less likely to be as, to show as many depressive symptoms, they're less likely to get burdened down by stress and anxiety, and they're more likely to be able to bounce back during more emotionally or physically tiring times. So that is New Start, and like I said, if you ever want to find more information, you can find that on newstart.com, and if you have any questions on that, feel free to ask them towards the end. But what I am going to go ahead and do right now is move into the portion that I know you all came here for, and that is to watch the cooking demos. And the first demo that we have is going to be our crispy kale chips. So let me go ahead and introduce our cooks, our speakers here. We have Maria coming on up, and so I'm going to turn things over to her. Morning, everyone. I'm glad you're all here. Um, so why kale chips? I'm sure you guys are wondering, like, uh, you know, kale, a lot of times kids are like, gross, I don't like it, don't want to touch it. Um, but this is an interesting way to have a nice little snack without it being full of chemicals and things that are not good for our kids and even ourselves. Sometimes, you know, especially like 
we're inside a lot and you know we want a snack and a couple of benefits just to go over kale um, if you didn't know um, it's one of the most nutrient dense foods it has a bunch of vitamins and minerals such as vitamin a vitamin k vitamin c b6 magnesium calcium copper potassium and magnesium so especially with everything going on i'm sure we can pack in a lot of um, beneficial nutrients and minerals kale is also loaded with antioxidants as well querosene being one of them um, another thing is it's as we mentioned it's an excellent source of vitamin c um, a lot of leafy greens are and this has power packed in kale and it also can help lower cholesterol um, and um, reduce the risk of heart disease again with sometimes having limitations of going out and such that's a very important thing to have in our diets to help reduce those problems um, kale is also one of the world's best sources of vitamin k and that also helps the ability to bind calcium so again um, and also help critical blood clotting that is activating certain proteins again to bind calcium um, there are also numerous cancer fighting substances in kale um, i encourage you to look into that as well it's also loaded with beta carotene and as we mentioned loaded with a bunch of minerals and it also helps and this is something again i know a lot of us do a lot of screen time since we're not outside sometimes whether it's our phones or computers and things like that for work or such um, it, it has nutrients that protect the eyes so it's very important as well and um, also can help with able in losing weight um, again with immobility sometimes whether we're not well or such that can also be very beneficial so enough said I'm gonna call my two helpers Luca and Jacob please if you can come it's a very simple step to do it's very easy um, I think the toughest part with kale chips is basically washing it really um, you can buy it where it's in a bag where it's already cut and chopped for you but I prefer to get the whole leaf only because you can manipulate getting this rough stock off of it because you really don't want to um, have this as part of your chip because it's too thick and too dense um, so Luca and Jacob if you want to just slowly show the process of taking the stock off the kale and then you can be chopping one on either side so jacob if you want to go on this side and look like you can go on that side you can go ahead and do that so um basically it's a very simple step process of de-leafing the kale you can do it i do it this way it's just very easy you could save the stock for juicing if you wanted to or for broth or for composting i mean there's a lot of uses you can also have with that but you see how it eliminates the stem off the middle and then the guys are just going to chop it up just kind of like a chip size and um, you want to make sure after you thoroughly wash your kale that you really keep it dry because if you leave a lot of water on it when you put it in the oven it'll wind up steaming and you don't want it to steam because then it won't get crispy so I usually use um, my salad spinner if you have something like that it draws the water out that way you're not using a bunch of paper towels and such that's very helpful as well um, and then after that process of deleafing the kale it's just a matter of adding very simple ingredients and you know you can make the, the um, kale chips your own it doesn't have to be um, this specific recipe I did two different kinds you can make it your own depending on what you like um, but it's just a very simple process so you guys are just going to chop some and then put it here and basically all you really have to do is once you have your kale chopped and um, and placed in your bin or your bowl you can add a little bit of um, oil not too much because it really doesn't need much because if you add too much oil it winds up again not becoming as crispy as it can be and you'll see once you have the samples from the back 
um, it will just bring the kale down. And you don't want to, when you wash it, you don't want to wash it where it has a lot of salt in the water. I put some salt in the water because it kills any bugs that could be hiding in there. Because again, kale is a very fibrous and it's a very quirky kind of um, leaf. So things can kind of migrate in there and hide in there. So don't leave it in the salt too long because it will wilt the leaf, which can be beneficial if you're making a salad because it could be kind of rough and coarse, but with kale chips, you don't want to do that. So once you have them cut and you put just about two tablespoons uh, of oil, it could be olive oil. That's the oil I usually prefer because it's going to bake at a low heat. Um, if it's a higher heat, you could use like a grapeseed oil. It has a um, better, um, it's not a carcinogen once it's baked or used in heat. But um, when you put the two tablespoons of oil, you basically are just gonna mix it evenly. And by mixing it evenly, you're gonna make sure that you don't have a glob of oil and then when you put the seasoning on, you're not gonna have a bunch of seasoning on one portion. So I'm gonna have Jacob put some oil in there, about two tablespoons. And then when we have the rest, we'll do that. And so it's best to do it by hand because when you do it by hand on like a spoon, you really get the oil incorporated on leaves versus, you know, not on one spot and not evenly distributed. And then when you put the seasoning on, it's best to sprinkle it, maybe half of the seasoning on, and then mix it, and then the next part of the seasoning on. So that way it's not all incorporated on part of it and not the rest. Thank you. And so, um, Jacob, if you want to just show them how, with, you know, how to mix to make sure it's incorporated in there. So in this recipe, we use the spice called tahini. I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with that, but it's a, a seasoning that has basic ingredients in it. It's not um, full of chemicals and such, and it has um, a little bit of salt. It has some lime, dehydrated lime. It has um, sea salt, chili peppers, but it's not hot. It's just flavorful. And so there's no artificial colors or flavors. So we put a little bit of that in there if you wanna add some, Luca. And then if you wanna mix it a little bit, and that's basically it. The, the key when you're putting it in the cookie sheet, you wanna make sure you don't have them too close together because if you keep it very close together, it's gonna steam. You wanna give it space, room, where you cover the entire cookie sheet. You don't see any spots empty, but not on top of each other because they won't get crispy. So about in the oven, 275, for about 20 to 30 minutes. Rotate them out because not every oven cooks evenly, so they make sure that one isn't crispy and one's kind of halfway there. So after that, you could just let them cool and they're ready to eat. So it's a very easy, quick snack that you can make and it's healthy for you. And since we're not gonna bake this portion, we're just gonna make it into a salad, which is another thing that kale can be made, as you probably know, into a very simple salad with similar seasonings. And you know, as I was making it for the kids the, a couple of weeks ago, we were actually preparing the kale and they were, some people were eating it before we even baked it. So it's actually a very good way of having it because like I said, sometimes when you see it in the rough, it's very coarse and very, undesirable, but once it's seasoned and kind of put in a, a way that, you know, people are going to want to try it, they'll feel a little bit more favorable. Yes. Spice mix, I actually got at Costco, but you can probably get it at any local store, any grocery store. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty available. The other recipe I did was just with a little bit of um, smoked paprika, garlic powder, and garlic, sorry, and um, onion powder, and some Himalayan salt, and a little bit of olive oil. Again, it's very simple. You can season it however you like. 
it's kind of like a salad, but it's just baking it. So anyone can be creative and how what they want to put it. Some people want it spicier or, or something like that. You can act, absolutely do that as well. All right, guys, I'm going to have you take these to the kitchen and we'll move on to the mac and cheese. But it cooks for about 30 minutes, as mentioned before, and it's ready to eat. Yes, it comes in a head. Yes, um, I used, out of this recipe, I used, I want to say, this is two heads of kale. And there's different kinds of kale, too. Another one that I tried in the other recipe with paprika is a, a purple kale. So there's different kinds. There's actually different textures. This is the most common one. I'm not sure of the name or the variety that this one is, but this is the most common one. But there are other varieties of it where it's a little bit coarser and the leaf is uh, longer versus wider like this. But this one tends to be the one I choose to use only because to me it seems like it's um, the way the leaf is, it'll give it a better way of staying crispy versus the other leaf is a little bit flatter. Yes, I, I put them in Ziplocs. And one way you can cheat too, you can take these to the um, kitchen guys. Thank you. Um, one thing you can do is put them in a Ziploc. I kind of cheated and once I baked them, I left the Ziploc open and put it in the fridge so it can cool faster, but not get soggy because if I close it, obviously if it's warm, it's gonna steam and then it's um, gonna lose its crunchiness. So if you're in a hurry and you wanna get it cooled down and close it down, you can do that. Any other questions? I've never tried freezing them, but you could try it. It is a vegetable and see, but the only thing I would worry about is freezer burn and the condensation factor. So it will probably make it wilt versus staying crispy. Can you please repeat the questions for the live audience? So they are not on the mic. Oh, when we they should ask have had a mic. That's okay. So yes. some people ask if you can freeze kale chips. So I wouldn't recommend it only because of the condensation factor and you might have it wilt once that happens um, from freezer burn possibly. And then the other question was, um, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? The baby kale? Oh, I don't remember the, the, oh, the purple kale. Yeah, the purple kale, it was just a different variety and, and stuff. So um, if you're looking for different kinds, you're more than welcome to try it. But the only reason why I use the most common one is because it tends to stay up away from the pan and it gets it a little bit crispier. So, but you know, you're more than welcome to try different kinds. Um, okay, so moving on, I guess we can move on to the mac and cheese if Gabby and Ashley can come up. This one's a little bit more All right, this one's a little bit more labor intensive, but I don't know about you, most kids and adults like mac and cheese. Um, and the nice thing is that it's vegan, so you don't have to worry about the after effects from dairy um, that can happen. Uh, the thing about this recipe, I have to say, that it does use a little bit of cashews. If someone doesn't like to use nuts, um, you could try the recipe without it, but the reason why it's in there, it kind of incorporates a little bit of fat and silkiness with the recipe, but you can certainly try it without it. Um, and they are raw, so you don't want to use like a salted or roasted or anything like that because it tends to blend better. So um, for the sake of time, the, the basic ingredients you could see from the list, you want to make sure that um, you use a basic box of, macro, of macaroni. Um, I believe that's like 16 ounces. I already have this um, 
cooked. And then it's gonna require some vegetables that you will put in a pot with some water. And I usually fill the pot to more than halfway so it covers the vegetables because they will be cooking for a while. And I tend to use the water from that. So that way you can use it for two reasons and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but you're gonna wanna have a large potato and um, I kind of tweaked this recipe from this. I wanted to give you the actual recipe that I tweaked it from, but just again, like anything you learn here, you can always make it your own. So it's more the basis. So after using the macaroni, you want to um, take one potato and a carrot. I usually use about two. Um, and then you want to take a large onion and boil that together in that pot of water. Once the, the vegetables are tender, you're gonna be at a point where you could say, okay, I can make the sauce. And so I take the vegetables out and I will start the macaroni in that water. But I'll also reserve some water, about two cups, because when I'm making the sauce, it kind of, helps incorporate everything that's gonna happen there. So obviously you'll add a little more water for the macaroni, but again, it's just adding flavor. If you're taking that water and dumping it out, you're throwing away all the nutrients from the vegetables and the flavor. So there's no point in that. So getting started on the sauce. So Gabby, you're gonna do that. It's best if you have like a food processor or, um, a blender because it's gonna help incorporate, you're gonna do that last. You're gonna um, help incorporate what we're gonna put together here for the sauce. And that kind of really makes the mac and cheese what it is. So you're gonna need to uh, measure out one fourth of a cup of cashews. And we're all gonna put it in the food processor. So that's one fourth. And then you're gonna put in some mustard. You're gonna put in a spoon. Again, I kind of doctored this recipe a little bit myself. So I put in some mustard as well. That's good. And then you're gonna put some sea salt. You put two tablespoons, sorry, teaspoons. Take that. Okay, and then we're gonna put some garlic in there. You can have, um, you know, obviously raw garlic. I had got it from a bottle just to save time. And you're gonna put in, I put in about two tablespoons just to start. I kind of like mine spicy. I don't know how everybody else likes theirs. But again, like anything else, this is more of the basic recipe but you can make it so many different ways. You can add veggie meat to it. You can make it spicy. You can make it, I mean, there's so many ways where you see your typical mac and cheese that you would see in restaurants, how they doctor it up. You can do the same thing. You could just make it your own and, um, you know, doctor it up that way in a healthy way. Um, so then after that, you're gonna need a fourth of a cup of oil and I use grapeseed oil because again, it has a neutral flavor because you're already adding a lot of other flavors. So you don't really need to use the olive oil. I don't like to cook the olive oil if I don't have to. Um, and the kale chips I did only because I used it kind of more of, and it's not a long time that it's cooking, um, but with this, it has plenty of flavor, so we're fine. And then you're gonna add um, some lemon juice. 
just squeeze some in there just to hope, make sure that that's not going there. And the cayenne, I know people are like, oh no, why are we using cayenne? Cayenne is very good for you for blood circulation, has a lot of benefits, but it adds a little bit of spice, but surprisingly enough, it's not spice where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm on fire. It's just a little hint of um, something there. Okay, so that's one fourth. No, of a teaspoon. And then the paprika is going to add the smokiness to it. And the paprika, I kind of, this is one of my favorite go-to spices. Um, it makes things smoky. I, I like the smoky kind versus just plain paprika because it gives it a nice um, flavor. And you could put one fourth as well. All right. And again, I usually put a little bit more only because it's just me. <laughs> um, so after the basic here is added, where did I put the lid? Sorry. You just get on. I'll just let it. I just let it blend to the point where it's chopped pretty fine and I'll check it and I see a couple of pieces so I'll let it go one more time. Okay, you can shut it. All right, so now is the fun part. It's gonna get messy. Um, now we get the vegetables that we already cooked the potato, the onion, and the um, carrot. And we add it to here. So you can just grab it with your hand, that's fine. And I added the two cups of liquid here already. You can break it up. You can break it up with your hand. Because mm -hmm. it's so soft. And you get it to the point where it's soft. It's best to do this when it's already hot because obviously whenever you blend these things, it, it makes it a lot easier. But um, you can just put it in because it's soft enough. That's the onion. And then I put like a carrot and a half because they're about average size carrots. And you can cut that a little bit. There you go. And then I will put the lid on. And then you can blend that. And you blend it again until it gets creamy. going to add water. Now, as you can see, it kind of needs some help. So that's why I saved the water. So we'll add it from here. And I'm going to have you hit the button and then on and off. So go ahead. Okay, stop. That potato is giving us a hard time, so we'll go in there. And we'll give it some help. Now, as you can see, the color is already looking like a cheddar. Turn it back on. And then you check for consistency. Okay, so we're gonna leave that a little bit on a little bit longer. You can turn it back on. Okay, 
inshallah. All right. So after you get your consistency where it's kind of somewhat smooth, always check for flavor because, again, not everyone likes things certain ways. Some people want less salt. Some people want more. So you can try it from there. Um, after that, do keep in mind this sauce can not only be for the mac and cheese, but you can make it for other things too. You can make it like a buffalo sauce if you want it for dips, chips, that kind of thing. You can warm it up, obviously, and it can be really nice too. You can have it cold, but again, it depends on what you like. So give it a try. It could be another thing that you can have as well um, and not have to worry about cheese. So after that, we're going to have Ashley combine this here. So Gabby, I'm going to have you help her. So you're going to put the macaroni in the bowl. And then Gabby, you're going to put half that mixture in there for her. Oh, sorry. And then hold on to that because it will come loose. Hold on to the bottom first. Hold on to the base. Mm -hmm. Now hold on to that one you pour. Um, couple of things. The reason why I'm only gonna, I only add, this is just me, but I only add half of the sauce into the mixture is because I tend to like to put some of the sauce on the top. So when the crumb comes on, it's not um, so dry kind of. So we'll do the crumb over here once the girls are done blending. But um, again, it's usually easier when the mac and cheese or the noodles are um, warm. Um, I couldn't see why not. You can give it a try. I've never tried it before, but it, you know, again, get creative. Why not? It's like um, a lot of times when I do a cream soup, you know, I won't use dairy and potato does add that factor of creaminess. Um, the carrot gives it the, the color and a little bit of the flavor. So you can pour about half of it in there, Gabby. You can pour more. Go ahead, keep going. Yeah, that's good. Again, this is usually not as thick. You can use your glove and just bring it back in. There you go. Um, it's usually not as thick. It's usually a little bit more runny when it's warm because the potato, be you know, becomes a little bit starchier. Sorry. You're welcome. Um, it gets a little thicker when it cools off. So it's best to do these things when it's warm. So while she's mixing that, I'm going to have you do the crumb, Gabby. Um, all you have to do is get some breadcrumbs and a bowl. You're going to come over here. Um, I use just some a little bit of olive oil, some parsley, and a touch of salt. Because a lot of times the breadcrumbs don't have any seasoning, so you're just adding a little bit of seasoning. And I like to use the, the pink salt because it has a lot of minerals. So um, you're just going to take your breadcrumbs. I like panko because it's really crunchy. And that's about two cups. And you're going to do this by hand. I like to do things by hand only because you incorporate things a little bit better. Um, you're going to take some parsley. And this, again, I do by eye. I'm sorry. Here we go. Just don't do anything. And you're going to put it together in your hand like that. Because it's too big when it's just whole. And then just, just some salt. It's a pinch. And then some olive oil. About a tablespoon. Just enough to incorporate everything. There you go. And then you're going to mix that. Yep. Then... The last step, Ashley, you're going to pour that in the bowl in a second. Let's see here. Ashley, 
before you do that, you're going to spread the oil on the pan a little bit. Just a touch. You're going to bring it all the way around in there. So that's just greasing the pan because you want to make sure that it doesn't stick to the bottom. Okay, you're good there, Debbie. And you're going to help spread it with her. All right, so now you're going to pour that in here. Gabby, if you want to help with the spoon, maybe you should hold the bowl. Okay, then you just spread it all around. And Ashley, I'm going to have you pour the rest of the sauce on top. Before you do, just one second. Okay. You're going to help her with this one. And then Ashley, hold on to that knob so it doesn't, there you go. And you're going to spread it out with the spoon, Gabby. And that kind of helps it from not becoming too dry. Sometimes, um, you know, between the baking process and such, and it kind of seeps in too. So it keeps it balanced. You can use the spoon and just get it up. There you go. All right, so you guys are going to spread the crumb on top. There you go, Ashley. You're gonna... Thank you, Gabby. And then I usually start from the corners because then it just fills the middle. So if you want to just outline the corners and then fill the middle. And that's basically it. Once um, everything has been incorporated, obviously when you start, preheat that oven. Um, so that way it's ready to go once you got everything on. And you could do it with your hand. That makes it easier, guys. Go with your hands, yeah. Um, and it bakes for about 30 minutes at 350, depending on your oven, and maybe a little more, a little less. Um, and that's basically it. And um, the kids love it. It's an, you know, it's a nice um, basic meal you can have with a salad, like with a kale salad, and there you are. That's mac and cheese. Does anybody have any questions? I I I haven't frozen it at this point, but I will um, prep everything except for the crumb on top. I'll leave that last. So if I do it like for Friday, I'll add the crumb maybe on Saturday and bake it, that kind of thing. So that way it doesn't get soggy. Um, so that's usually what I I'll do. Anything else? All right, that is the basic mac and cheese. Thank you. Yeah. Now our next recipe is going to be done by Kevin. It's going to be a lentil roast. And so he's going to come on up here and then we're going to take just a quick minute to make sure that his mic gets put onto him. We're, we're very fancy like that. But just sit tight and then we'll get into our next recipe.
Okay, when am I ready? Whenever I want to be? Okay. First of all, this is W on the first slides that you saw, water. You got to drink a lot of water. It's one of the main things. All right. Okay. So, on the handout it says vegan baked lentil roast. Now, in the cookbook I took this from, it says British lentil loaf. So, I don't know why they call it British lentil. Maybe the British like to eat a lot of lentils or something. Or, But anyways, um, it's basically a recipe that uh, from a book that we, we had a vegan restaurant in Oak Park Terrace back from 1985 to 1995. And so this recipe is actually one of the things we used to serve at a restaurant. And, uh, and I tend to, when I cook, I still tend to think sometimes I'm cooking for a restaurant. I always double recipes and triple recipes and they ended up, well, it's a good way because you end up freezing stuff. But anyways, um, now lentils are an extremely nutritional product. And if I didn't erase it on my phone, let me see if I can find it real quick. I'm just going to read. Oh, here. Okay, lentil. Nutrition, benefits, and how to cook them. Okay. Now, you know, now on the internet, you can find all kinds of weird stuff because it says, you know, is, is eating lentils dangerous? And if you click on it, it says, you know, it tells you if you eat them raw. You know, you know anybody who eats raw lentils? No. Okay. And there's lots of different kinds of lentils. The ones I use for this one are, you know, brown lentils. But there's green lentils and yellow and red and beluga. Those are little tiny black lentils. And I think the main ones are green and brown. But you find a lot of red lentils, like, you know, in Indian restaurants, Indians use red lentils. And Middle Eastern ones, people use yellow lentils a lot in their restaurants. And... Anyways, nutrition benefits, in one cup of cooked lentils, okay, 230 calories, 39.9 grams of carbs, 18, 17.9 grams of protein, 0.8 grams of fat, 15.6 grams of fiber, it's a lot. And then 18% of B6, 10% of niacin, you know, and then it goes on. 37% of iron that you need for the day, 17 zinc, and there's, you know, a bunch of more uh, smaller minerals, okay. Now, you know, I like, uh, you know, the previous presenter. What's your name again? Uh, yeah, Maria. Okay, when I cook, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, I kind of just... I don't really, you know, measure stuff like, you know, I'm just going to dump this in there. It's supposed to be a cup of chopped walnuts, but this is what I had left at home, you know, so I'm going to just dump that in. And I made, I actually made the finished products earlier this week because this is like a two-step baking process and you have to bake the stuff for an hour and then you add, uh, you know, your choice of topping. It says ketchup on the recipe. Okay, you can do whatever you want. You can, uh, do. Trader Joe's has some very good organic barbecue sauces and they're pretty cheap too. This whole bottle's like two sixty nine, and they got some Sriracha barbecue sauce or Kansas city or whatever they are. But, and then there's a yellow gold barbecue sauce and they're all very good. But this, for this recipe, it calls for ketchup. And in the recipe book, I got this from, there's a, actually a recipe to make your own ketchup, which we used to do in our restaurant. We made our own ketchup, see? And, uh, and almost everything in this recipe is organic. You know, I try to buy organic whenever I can. And I try never to use GMO products. Uh, GM, the two of the biggest uh, bad things to eat is anything that has GMO. Okay, that's called genetically modified organisms. And also high fructose corn syrup. Very dangerous. Very dangerous to eat. And there's a very good uh, documentary on GMOs. I can tell you what it is. It's called Genetic Roulette. You should look it up and watch it sometime. It shows, you know, that it's a direct correlation to why there's so many food allergies and Crohn's disease and digestive disorders and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I guess I, I could 
talk about that for an hour, but it's a wonderful documentary. It's kind of chilling, actually, to watch. It's very scary, but very informative. But anyways, so these lentils, I cooked them already, you know, so the recipe says uh, uh, one and three-fourths cup dry lentils, about four cups cooked, so there's probably more than four cups in there, but I'm going to actually probably measure them out. Let's see how it works. Okay, and you pretty much follow the directions on the, you know, cooking the lentils. You put them in the pot, you cover them three inches above. You just follow the directions, and if there's extra liquid left, you can, you know, you can drain it, but save the liquid because there, when you uh, drain it, there's some heavy brown stuff on the bottom that you can add back to the recipe, which is, you know, some of the, you know, nutrition stuff in the lentils, and it actually has a lot of flavor. You put it back in. And... Uh, Okay, so okay, no, that's not what, that was two and a fourth cups of chopped onions, but it kind of sank down. But anyways, that's actually a cup and a half. But when we uh, oh no, I know. Okay, it was two and a half cups of raw chopped onions. Okay, so that this is correct. So this is how much it made. You know, you just saute it, and uh, this time I used olive oil. Uh, sometimes olive oils are very, very strong in flavor, and they kind of can overtake the recipe. And plus, um, cooking in olive oil for a long length of time, the olive oil has uh, a very, you know, low, fl high flash point or something, so it's actually better, you know, if you're going to cook, and saute a bunch of stuff, it's actually better to cut the olive oil, maybe with some coconut oil or with some avocado oil. And avocado oil is very neutral, you know, very neutral tasting. And you can get a bottle like that big at Costco for like 15 bucks or something. And it's very, very neutral tasting. But in this case, it doesn't call for that much, so I just use the, uh, you know, the uh, olive oil for this. And then, um, the minced garlic, they also sell bags of, you know, garlic cloves. So I take some shortcuts at Costco. There are big bags for nine bucks, and they're in the refrigerated section. So I'll cook like half a bag at a time. I cook, I saute them in a pan, you know, and then I add turmeric to them and cayenne pepper and salt. And the turmeric actually acts as a food preservative. Besides being so good for you, it's actually a food preservative too. And so if you cook up a batch of that, it lasts for a month in the refrigerator. You see, so then it's then it's cheap and easy. So then I then I just took the cloves. These are raw cloves, okay? But I took the cooked ones out, and then they're easy to cut because they're real nice and soft, you know. And then you just dump them in with the onions and saute them just a little bit more. Or Trader Joe's sells these frozen garlic cubes. They're like two bucks for you know. You can just pop a couple out. The taste is a little, you know. There's they're mixed with oil and stuff, so they're a little, you know. And they don't, you know, they're, they're, but they're fine to use in a pinch. All right, another ingredient is soy milk. This isn't soy milk, this is oat milk. Actually, it's almond milk and oat milk mixed because I just dumped some almond milk to make sure I had enough, so I mixed them together. And then there's also macadamia. In, oh, and at Costco, you can get three half gallons of organic almond milk for nine bucks. Okay, and in that trader, you know, you can get them anywhere, but. And then there's oat milk product at Costco. This is very good. And they also have a macadamia milk now, too. And they're all very good. And you can mix and match them together, whatever you want. But um, and people sometimes say, well, cooking organic is expensive. Well, you know what? It's really not. If you kind of know what you're doing, like these lentils, you can get them in bulk at Costco, or I mean at Whole Foods. The bulk section, it's, it's pretty reasonable, you know, for organic. And, you know, Whole Foods, their prices... If you know what to shop for there, if you buy their, if you buy the name, the 365 brand at Costco, if you buy all their organic cereals and, you know, their, you know, milks or ice cream, I shouldn't maybe talk about ice cream here, but I, I admit I eat ice cream sometimes. But anyway, it's, you know, if you buy the 365 brand, their pastas, they're very reasonable. Or you go to Jewel and you buy their old brand. So you got their old brand of organics and it's all very reasonable, so. And Trader Joe's has some nice products, so. All right, anyways, let me move this along here. 
All right, organic tomato sauce. It says uh, it says tomato puree. Tomato sauce and puree is kind of like the same thing. So, all right, yeah, Costco whole wheat flour. I don't know where I got this from. Probably from Whole Foods. Pink Himalayan sea salt. Okay, there's extra minerals in there supposedly. So, is there? Okay. Non-GMO onion granules, onion powder from Costco. They got organic stuff too. Spray, avocado spray, okay. Normally I would do like Maria did. I would just dump the oil and push it around my fingers and stuff. But okay, now Trader Joe's for people who are lazy, they already got chopped baking pieces of walnuts, you see. So that's one of the ingredients. And then the sage, now this is wild sage, you see. This is from South Dakota. We were on a long road trip this summer, and it was wonderful to go, you know, travel around. Hardly anybody was traveling. It was beautiful. So we picked all this wild sage, and this, I don't know if this is the stuff we got from South Dakota, but you could pick it and while you're walking around, you eat it and stuff. But so we're just going to rub some of that and break some of that up. Okay, so that's all the ingredients that need to go in there. Okay. Now here's what the consistency kind of varies once in a while on this. Okay, but here's what the finished product looks like. See, when I'm done, you know, putting it in this pan, it's not gonna have the topping. See, in this case, I just use ketchup, okay. Now, personally, I like it better with this Trader Joe's organic barbecue sauce, okay. And it's even really good too with like sriracha barbecue sauce. Okay, so you can do whatever you want. Sometimes I do half and half. I'll make half ketchup and half barbecue sauce. So you just you know figure it out, or you can shake some cayenne and mix it in with the lentils. But in this case, we didn't do any of that. See, but that's how it looks, and the consistency. It you know it'll sort of come out in chunks. See, you know, but uh, it's very nice. All right. Anyways, so. So, anyways, um, well, I'm taking this one home with me anyway, so nobody, I'm not going to touch nothing. All right. All right, so here, four cups of lentils. Measure them out pretty good anyways. Two. Three. Four. Okay. Now, see, I got lentils left over. I can, you know, throw a little, make them soup, you know, or if I was at home, I would just dump them in here and, you know, add other stuff to it. All right, so there's that. So we're going to try to keep it fairly accurate here. All right, here's the onions and the garlic. Okay, just sauteed already. Just dump them right in there. Okay. All right, uh, what else? Oh yeah, the oat milk, okay. It says soy milk, half a cup. All right, so here's a one cup container, so we'll just, yeah, it's close enough. All right, it's good enough. All right, here's, oh, here's another, okay. Celery and green peppers, okay. Sometimes green peppers can kind of overtake a recipe, you know, they're kind of like very strong. Okay, in this recipe, they actually work very good. But again, sometimes I just, sometimes I use what I had on hand and at Trader Joe's, they sell bags of frozen chopped peppers. Okay, and they're green, red and yellow all mixed together. So this is, that's what this is. This is just the green, yellow and red chopped peppers mixed together. So we'll dump them in there. And the celery is also in there. Those do not need to be cooked ahead of time. All right, so then let's see here. Whole wheat flour. I suppose if you're trying to be, you know, if you're trying to do gluten stuff like that, you can probably, you know, uh, put a different kind of flour in. I suppose I never tried it before, but I'm sure you could. And let's see, well, we don't have a, 
Yeah, we'll just put it through. We'll just dump nothing in there. I don't know. That's probably about a quarter cup. I think the whole thing was close enough. Okay. All right. And what else? Oh, yeah. Okay. Tomato puree, one and a half cups. This is like 15 ounces. So what's that? That's like two cups, basically. So... Uh, I would probably, I would if, like a, if I was at home, I would just be dumping all this stuff together. I'd have put, poured the lentils, I'd have poured everything together, and you know, because that's how it, it is sometimes. If you're a little short on this, if you're a little short on that, it still works out fine, you know. But in this case, we'll dump. Uh, what does it say? One and a half. All right. So, all right, and the rest will go into lentils. There you go. Okay. All right, onion powder. Granul I like granulated onion better because onion powder kind of goes all over the place if you're you know trying to make stuff it starts flying around so yeah, okay one tablespoon so all right oops that's only a teaspoon how many teaspoons in a tablespoon three right two all right. Okay, that's it. Boy, who planned who planned that out? Okay. All right. Salt, pink Himalayan sea salt. Now, supposedly, like I said, it's got all these extra things, but we'll see. Two teaspoons. Okay. Now, personally, I like extra salt, but I won't do it here. I love salt. Only the good kind good for you. All right, chopped walnuts. Oh, they're, you know what, they're kind of, they're still a little kind of big, but they'll do. You know, they're just, all right, one cup chopped walnuts. Close enough, one cup. Hey, there you go. All right, what else, is that it? Onion powder, walnuts, salt, sage. Oh, the sage. Okay. Now the sage. This is very nice. I don't want to put these stems in here. And you can use the sage in the bottle too. You can just buy the stuff you know in the bottle. But this, this uh, this is from South Dakota. Probably Custer State Park or somewhere like that, where it grows wild. Ooh. Smells good too. It's good to just eat just like that. All right, we'll just dump a little extra in there. Okay, beautiful. All right, the stems, we'll, we'll leave those out. All right, mix it all together. Okay, all right, just mix it up good. All right. Oh, yeah, it looks good enough to eat. You could actually eat this just like this, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's that. Okay. Now, like I say, I usually, you know, just dump stuff in there, and the recipes usually turn out too big, so I brought an extra pan. So. All right. So, uh... Here's the bad thing about cooking spray. It tends to over spray the pan. So you gotta, you know, then you gotta wipe up a mess. So I'll spray a little in there. It's better, it's, it's actually way cheaper just to take the bottle of oil like and dump them in there. Okay. Wipe it in there real good. All right. Technically, this pan is probably too big too. See, this is like the official pan it calls for in the recipe. This eight by eight, you know, about that height. So, this is eight by eight, but it's too tall. So we're gonna not fill it up as much. All right, and then that'll be the, for the overflow. We don't want to let this good sage go to waste. There we go. All right, whoopsie. 
that's about right, right there. So you fill it up about that much, just like that. Dump the rest in the other one. See, it's nice to make a little extra too, because now I got a little pan I can give give to somebody or something, you know. Like I can give it to my my sister, because my sister gives me nice food sometimes. So every once in a while, I got to give her some. Except usually she gives me cookies and stuff. Which, although my sister, she's a pretty healthy cook now. She's getting there. She really is. All right, so that's that. Okay. Now what you do is you bake these in the oven for about an hour um, at 350. Okay, and then after they're done, you know, and like I'm saying, the consistency is kind of inconsistent. Okay, so it might, you know, scoop out real nice or it might, like these are pretty good today. And I froze this one. These have been frozen for five days the one that we're sampling out. So it might be a little soupier than usual, but it's fine. So then after you're done baking it for about an hour or so, then you take whatever you want, whichever thing, and it's, you're supposed to measure it out to a cup, but you know, you can do that. That's great actually, if you measure it, but you just put it all over the top or dump it all over the top. And, you know, I tend to like a little more sauce than you know, than not and stuff, anything I eat basically. So there you go. So you bake these up for an hour, then you put them back in, dump the stuff on, put them in for another 15 or 20 minutes and you're done. Just let them sit, let them sit for a little while till they, so they set up just a little bit. All right. Yeah, we used to have a good time at a restaurant. Can you imagine we had Chefs and people, you know, they they told me what to do. You know, I actually went to New York City for six months for vegan chef training. This is when there was like 30 of these restaurants around the world called Country Life Vegan Restaurants. So we learned a lot of stuff. It was really, really wonderful. So, all right, any questions, anybody? All right, beautiful. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. This looks great. And don't worry, we'll be able to enjoy some samples in a bit. Um, but thank you, Kevin. So our lentil roast, that was our lentil roast. And in case you are wondering, the book that Kevin said this recipe is from is called Country Life Cookbook. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, the Country Life Cookbook. I know there's not that many on Amazon, but you can still give a Google search or Worrell and see if you can find one if you're interested. And next up, we'll have Veronica and Enoch and Ezekiel are going to be helping her. So just sit tight for a few more minutes while we transition between recipes, and then we'll go on to our next two recipes for today. Thank you.
Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Veronica, and I'm here with my sons, Ezekiel and Enoch. Um, <clears throat> is it on? I hear myself. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, for the live. It's not on. I don't think it's on for the, for the live stream. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Um, okay, so um, pretty much every week um, on Sabbath mornings, I like to make oatmeal because it fills us up and it holds us down for the whole sermon and waiting for lunch and everything. So I usually make a big pot enough, you know, to feed the four of us at home. And I usually have leftover oatmeal. And I'm always wondering, I know, leftover oatmeal, what, that sounds really strange. But I usually make a big pot, and whatever's left over, I always wonder, okay, what can I make with it? I feel bad throwing it out. No one likes to eat it the day after. So one day I was looking at recipes, and I found a leftover oatmeal recipe. So um, I made these cookies one day, and I told the boys and my husband, I said, here, have a cookie. And they were like, what's this? So I told them it's leftover oatmeal cookies. And as soon as they tried it, it was a hit. And we haven't gone back ever since. So now I purposely make extra oatmeal just so I have um, the, the leftover oatmeal for us. And the good thing is, is that we're going to be going camping soon. And this makes a really good snack in the breakfast for the you know, morning breakfast, a breakfast snack or something. You, instead of granola bars or something, now you have your own, um, a quick, hefty oatmeal snack. Um, so we're going to get started here with... Um, we need two bowls, uh, one for the dry ingredients and one for the wet ingredients. So for the dry right now, can you give me two cups of flour? And of course, one boy can't help, it has to be both. So um, I have my two sons of thunder over here. Enoch, come over here for a second. You're gonna help me with the wet ingredients. So while we get the dry ingredients, um, we're gonna put together the two cups of flour we're gonna get um, your two teaspoons of baking powder. And then what I like to do, since we don't eat eggs in our home, um, I have, this has an egg, uh, two eggs on here. So what I do, I use egg replacement. And what I use is flaxseed or chia seeds. Um, so if you put, to make one egg, you use uh, a ta two, one tablespoon of chia seeds and about two tablespoons of water. Let it sit for about 15 minutes or so, and it'll thicken up, and that'll become your, your binding agent for whatever you wanna make, cakes, cookies, um, any kind of baking that you do. You can use the, the chia and the flax seeds, and both of them are very rich in, um, they're very rich in omega, uh, omega-3 fats, fatty acids. Um, is that what it says, fatty acids? <laughs> um, good source of vitamins and minerals. Um, just one tablespoon of flaxseed contains 37 calories and 1.3 grams of protein. So if you're looking for some extra protein, you can also use chia seeds and flax seeds for that extra protein that you're missing, especially with a vegan diet. We don't, everyone's like, oh, how do you get your protein? There's so many ways you just have to investigate. And I have found that, you know, a lot of legumes and, and, and um, beans and um, now I've come to realize that chia seeds and, and the flax seeds also um, contain a lot of protein for us. So over here, I already had some of it kind of soaking up in there so you can see that it's, you know, pretty thick. <laughs> and then the flax seed as well is thickening up as well. And that'll be, that'll be our binding agent right there. <clears throat> so can you put two 
teaspoons. So we have here's a half a teaspoon. Here's a half a teaspoon. Here's your teaspoon of baking powder, and then we're gonna do our cinnamon. And our salt is right here. Now you, what we're gonna do is get our. I didn't bring the butter, did I? I didn't bring my butter. Ah. Okay, so I forgot the butter. I guess I can't make the pigs, but I can mix everything in here just so you can see what it looks like. And then um, I'll add the butter when I get home. I guess I can't make this here. <laughs> I forgot the butter. Okay, so what you can do is pour this in this bowl. What, we, what I usually start with is we put the butter in there with the sugar, you mix it, and then um, it starts to lighten up and get fluffy. So that'll be the, the, the start of your cookies for the wet ingredients. Um, the, the butter should be softened just so that it's easier to blend. Um, and then you, so you first you put the butter and the sugar and then um, once that's all blended up, you add your, egg, your eggs or egg replacement to the bowl. Um, make sure that all of that is combined together as well. Once all of that is combined, you can add your oatmeal, whatever leftover. Um, for this recipe, that'll make about 20 to 30 cookies, depending on how big you want your cookies. Um, for this one, it'll make about 20. Put two cups of your leftover oatmeal um, in your wet ingredients. Make sure all of that is combined together. Then once all the wet ingredients are combined, uh, you'll, you're going to want to put, it's up to you, well, you can either put the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients or the dry ingredients into the wet ingredients. This recipe is very forgiving. One time I said, oh, I know how to do this off the top of my head, and I just threw everything in. I'm like, oh, there's a process to it. Usually for baking, there's a science, and it's, it's got to be precise. This one is very forgiving. I threw everything together, and they still came out delicious and fluffy and pretty good. So whichever one you want to do is totally fine. Um, and also to the wet ingredients, you got to put, you don't have to, but it tastes good, uh, about two tablespoons of lemon juice. So I like to cut a fresh lemon uh, and just squeeze the juice in there. And then um, you can add, since the oatmeal, depending on how you make it, I, I like to add syrup or honey. Um, I also add a little bit of sugar in there just to sweeten it up for the boys. Um, since it's already sweet, you can pretty much play with how sweet you want them as a cookie. Um, this recipe calls for, uh, it says, where's the sugar? Half a cup. I have done half a cup or even a little less just because our oatmeal is already pretty sweet in itself, even with the fresh fruits in there. So you can play with the sweetness depending on your taste. Um, so you put, put your half a cup of sugar in there, and once all of that is all mixed up and, and, and put together, um, in the kitchen, I have some cookies on the window there, if you can bring the tray of the cookies, sorry. Um, yeah, I just feel bad that I forgot the butter of, the whole, of all the things, otherwise I would show this all to you. Um, so... Once you blend all of that, not blend it, you mix it together, um, it's going to get really hard to mix with the hand mixer. Um, so once you get that flour in there, you can start folding it in uh, with the spoon, or you can even use your hands because it, it will, if, it, if, if it's fresh, it'll get sticky on your hands. Um, but if you let the oatmeal cool down a little bit, it won't feel so sticky on your hands. So you can mix it pretty good with your hands or the spoon. Um, and then when you're gonna put it on your cookie tray, you know, put your parchment paper on your tray, uh, you can either put them in little balls so that it's easy for kids to just grab and go, or you can make them into um, flattened, more flattened cookie size. You can make it as big as you want, as little as you'd like. Um, here, let me, let me just grab this one cookie here. So I grabbed like a fourth of a cup of batter and I put this on the cooking sheet and I just flattened it out with a spoon. And the, the good thing is, is that these cookies, not like chocolate chip cookies tend to like rise and then they flatten out 
these cookies, whatever shape you leave them on the pan, that's how they're gonna bake. So it's up to you how fun you wanna make it for your kids. Um, Bite-sized little mini balls or nuggets or just flat big pancakes even. Um, that's how they'll cook. And you can even add extra um, dried fruits in there while you're mixing your oatmeal with the wet ingredients. You can add, I know I, we sometimes add extra cranberries, dried cranberries, um, pecans. Um, for the sake of allergies, I know I left out um, the pecans and I used, um, what did I use? I, was, I, I had used um, a soy-free butter as well. Um, and all of this you can find in all of your grocery stores now. Um, a lot of vegan options are available almost in every store. Um, the, I cannot believe it's not butter. The vegan one tastes really good. Um, they also sell the sticks of butter. So it, everything has come so easy now. Um, do you guys like these cookies? I really like them. <laughs> <laughs> do you like these cookies? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So yeah, they're, they're pretty much a fan favorite in our home. And they're not that sweet. They're not, um, you know, they're, they're sweet enough to please their palates, which is what I'm happy about. Comment, it's so good that um, we literally finished a whole batch of cookies. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, the recipe that I'm handing out to you guys is for um, about 20 cookies, depending on how big you want to make them or how small you want to make them. So, um, are there any questions? I know we're short on time, so I kind of cut this short. Thankfully, I forgot the butter, I guess. But is there any questions about anything here? The process or anything? I wish I could incorporate more, but it's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory. Just throw everything in there, and it's easy to go. And the kids like to come in here and measure and mix and do everything. So it's a really, really fun recipe to make especially with the boys, because it's something that they like to eat, something that they like to do, and it's easy for them to, it's easy for him to even just do it by himself if he wants to. I mean, the, the measurements are really easy, and I like to add in math. Sometimes I'll say how many, uh, if I want to make it into a, 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 a bigger recipe, you know, we kind of try to put math in there. What's half a teaspoon and half a teaspoon? Do you, so I like to incorporate education as long as, as well as the baking. So it's fun, and hopefully if you have nieces and nephews or grandkids or, any other family members that you can all join in and bake it and it'll be good for you and filling as well. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Veronica. Oh, thank you, Enoch and Ezekiel. So those were our leftover cookies and now we have our final recipe, number five. And Reness is gonna come on up here and show us how she's going to make her vegan sugar cookies. Do you want to? Okay, let's see. All right, hello everyone. Today, I, our recipe for today will be vegan 
cinnamon sugar coated cookies. These cookies have only six ingredients and they're easy to make and fun, delicious to taste. So we have two cups of almond flour, this one right here. So I'm gonna use this and put it here. Then we're going to have one third cup of brown sugar. I like using date and coconut sugar. They're healthier, so. Um, there we go. Then one teaspoon of cinnamon, ground cinnamon. All of these are organic ingredients. And then one teaspoon of baking powder. And then one fourth teaspoon of sea salt. After we put all these ingredients, we will be mixing them. We will combine all the ingredients and whisk till there are no clumps. So we can have a smooth texture. Okay. So we wanna mix them all together thoroughly because we don't want half of the cookie to be salty. Half of the one to have no taste at all. So we wanna mix them together. And then after you've done that, we will add one fourth cup of warm water. Okay, and then we will mix them again. We will add the warm water and stir, there you go, until it's like a dough. It's supposed to have like a Play-Doh texture even though it's not exactly tasting like Play-Doh obviously, and so we'll mix until it has that texture. All right, and all, as I said, all of these ingredients are organic for a healthier purpose. All right, so next, it's still here a little bit, so we wanna mix until all the flour is basically in the mixture. So after we've done that, we're going to go ahead and make balls using a scooper and place them on parchment paper on top of a baking pan. So the parchment paper is unbleached and totally quarantine free. So with the scooper, we're gonna take them, the, these cookies, and put them right here and make pop them and them up until they make a cookie shape. So I'm just gonna do a few of these, not the whole thing. Okay. And smooth them down. And so after you fill the whole pan with them, you will put cinnamon sugar coating. And this is optional if you don't want to. It will contain one teaspoon of cinnamon and one fourth brown white sugar. I like using date sugar though. So once you have this, you'll take this and put, put some in here. Let's see if I can put some in here. And then we will sprinkle them on top of the cookies to give them like a sugar coating. And then, then we'll put them in the refrigerator for 30 minutes. And after we've done that, we will preheat the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit and bake them for 15 minutes or until just lightly golden. And then you will enjoy. Any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Renes. These look fantastic. All right, so these were all of the recipes that we have. We hope that you'll be able to take them home, enjoy them with your friends, with your families, or if you just wanna keep it to yourself, we're okay with that too. Now we do have a couple of uh, reminders or announcements as well. You may or may not be wondering where on earth did we get all of these fantastic kids from. We do have a group here at this church called Pathfinders and Ruben is gonna come on up and we also have a quick video for you so that you understand a little bit more about the life skills that we're teaching the children and, and how they got into this skill set particularly. Hi, my name is Ruben Amaro. I'm the director for Pathfinder Club here and uh, just wanna 
say that um, pleasantly surprised about the involvement that Pathfinders had today in the cooking class. And that is one of the messages that we, uh, that we definitely uh, instill in kids that uh, nutrition, exercise, and all, all around good health is part of, is part of the design uh, from the beginning. So that is one of the things that we definitely uh, teach and encourage. And we ourselves as adults have to set the example. That is the reason why you saw some of the uh, experts here that, uh, that cook some of these great foods that we cannot wait to taste. And in light of that, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about what we do as a club. So we'll, uh, we'll introduce a uh, video about the Pathfinders here at uh, our church. Two hundred years ago, when groups of settlers wanted to move into an uncharted region of the American continent, they hired a guide to take them, someone who could show them the way through dangerous mountain passes, to lead them across raging rivers, to defend and protect them against wild animals. These guides were known as pathfinders. They were the ones out in front, ahead of the party leading the way. While the country today is not the uncharted and wild frontier it was centuries ago, the journey that awaits our current young people can sometimes seem just as challenging. They often must navigate through a jungle of academics, busy schedules, and most of all, peer pressure. And during these critical years, boys and girls begin to form their own values and worldviews that they will carry with them for the rest of their lives. Here, at the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church, we believe the best way for a child to survive this enormous wilderness of life is for them to follow the great Pathfinder guide, Jesus Christ. The Pathfinder Club is a worldwide organization sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, though young people ages 10 to 15, of any religious persuasion are welcome. Here, in the city of Elmhurst, Illinois, stands the Elmhurst Sentinels Pathfinder. Equipped with trained volunteers, many who are parents themselves, our club offers its members a wide range of engaging activities that help build a young person's intellectual, physical, and spiritual foundation. Our Pathfinder Club regularly meets two to three times monthly, during which members get to physically meet with one another, engage in social interaction, study valuable spiritual lessons from the Bible, acquire a sense of responsibility and discipline, and learn practical life skills and hobbies. While a healthy mind is key for a child's development, a healthy body is just as crucial. Pathfinders enrolled in the club will learn the importance of building healthy habits, such as staying physically active and getting proper nutrition. They will also spend a great deal of time outdoors in nature, as they participate in activities such as camping and hiking. During these outings, Pathfinders will become familiar with survival skills that cannot be learned at home, ranging from fire building to orienteering. As Pathfinders acquire knowledge, learn valuable skills, and make lasting memories, we encourage them to also put these in good use by serving the community. All members will regularly assist in various forms of volunteer service and civic engagement, such as food drives and showing appreciation to our community leaders. But most importantly, in all of our engagements, we strive to share the light of Jesus and the hope of his soon return to everyone we meet. We are Pathfinder Strong. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Sharina and Anna for letting us be part of uh, this uh, cooking class. And uh, any information that you may have uh, for uh, for uh, children you may have in your family, see us. We're always willing to welcome new members that uh, we continue to uh, prepare these kids for what 
uh, the upcoming life as uh, young adults and eventually adults. So thank you for uh, your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. And thank you everyone for coming here. Thank you everyone for helping as well. We always enjoy our online audience too. Thank you from far away or wherever you're tuning in from. Um, just a last reminder for our next series, which is gonna be on April 11th. That's also a Sunday. We will be having Dr. Manuel Alva do a, an entire weekend of health series. So we encourage you to come on by. Um, there will also be an online streaming of those videos too. And if you want to grab a flyer on your way out, they are on the corner of this table here. And for those of you who are tuning in online or if anyone in general has any questions, please feel free to contact us here at the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church and we'll be able to help you out. Are there any final questions? All right, well, I'm gonna invite Ezekiel to come on up here and he's gonna have, he has a, a quick note about the recipe they made about their cookies and then he's gonna do a really quick closing prayer for us. So um, I, when you um, make the cookies, once they're all done, um, set the oven to 350 and then let them bake for 20 minutes. Thank you. Right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We thank you that um, we could learn about um, you and that we could also learn about being healthy and living pure lives for you. Right, we thank you for everybody that has um, volunteered to come here uh, and do thing and do something like do a recipe so that we can learn to be healthy um, and to also and to um, just be close to you. Thank you for everything that you've always done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Don't forget to grab a sample on your way out, and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.